Throughout history, there have been people who have committed some of the most heinous crimes fathomable. For those crimes, they have been convicted and sentenced to death. Welcome to Death Row Executions, where we take a look into the lives of society's worst offenders. And now, your host, Air. I don't feel guilt in the sense that if I had done something differently, that it could have been prevented. I don't feel that type of guilt. I, sometimes I feel that I could have said something earlier about, about the things that Adrian was doing and maybe earlier it could have been prevented or maybe not even agreed with it at first. I ask myself, what could I have done differently? You know, I do do that, but not to the extent that I feel guilt about it now. Frances Elaine Newton was born on April 12, 1965 in Texas. She grew up in a large religious family with 10 other siblings. She said that she got along great with her siblings and that her parents treated her fairly well. Despite growing up in a loving home, Frances chose to hang around boys that were getting into trouble and ended up meeting a young boy by the name of Adrian. The two became sexually active and Frances had her first child when she was just 15 years old. Her son's name was Alton. Frances and Adrian stayed in a relationship together despite their age, and Frances was able to continue living with her parents. Although they were a Christian family, Frances expressed that her family was very supportive. Even though they did not encourage teenage pregnancy, they were there for her, and she was able to graduate high school and eventually become an accountant. I had a lot of support. I, I had my first child early, uh, uh, my parents were very disappointed in me, uh, but they said, okay, this happened, don't make the mistake again, you know, and they encouraged me to continue being a teenager because I was a teenager, uh, but at the same time, they helped me to be a good mother to my son. And Adrian's mom and dad were very supportive, as was he. Um, it must have been tough, so young. <laughs> You know, it really wasn't because I had uh, my big sisters and my big brothers, and so my son had all these aunts and uncles around and grandparents. It really wasn't tough. I mean, and I don't say that to encourage teenage pregnancy. Uh, I think that I was, I was very blessed to have the support that I did. Francis and Adrian ended up having another child together, a little girl named Farah. They got married and ended up moving in together in an apartment in Houston, Texas, but their relationship was far from perfect. Adrian became a drug addict, and it's been documented that both Francis and Adrian would buy, sell, and use drugs together. Adrian was also not faithful and cheated on Francis multiple times. After finding out that her husband was cheating, Francis decided that she would do the same thing to get back at him. Adrian ended up finding out about Francis cheating on him and they both agreed they were no longer going to cheat on each other. Their pact meant nothing, and they both ended up getting into new relationships with other people while still married and living together. Adrian hadn't been faithful in a marriage uh, for several, several times. And on my part, after so many times, I thought, okay, well, I'm gonna do this and let him see how it feels, you know, and I did. and. That wasn't a good thing on my part. So one of the things that I was gonna fix is I wasn't gonna do that anymore. Um, I had, unfortunately, I had started a relationship with a guy that I'd gone to school with. And of course he was upset about that and I wanted him to be because I wanted him to feel what I had felt. You know? And when I say that I wanted to fix it, that's one of the things that I had done is said, cut that relationship off. And, and he said that he would quit doing, you know, quit running around, he would quit doing drugs, and he would quit doing illegal activity. Adrian was still dabbling in drugs and had his brother Sterling move in with him and his family. Adrian got into trouble with the law quite a few times, but Francis was no stranger to getting in trouble either. In 1986, at the age of 21, she was busted for forgery, and although she was able to avoid prison time, she was sentenced to probation for three years. A previous employer also came out at a later date 
stating that Frances was fired from her job for stealing. The same year she was sentenced, a state farm agent by the name of Claudia Chapman proposed the idea of selling Frances auto insurance. Frances did not want it, so it's been said that Claudia initially suggested getting life insurance policies because they had benefits of acting as savings accounts. Frances said that she initially turned down that offer as well. In February of 1987, Frances's cousins died in a house fire and the family could not scrape up enough money to pay for proper funerals. It was then that Frances's father told her that she should prepare for the future because anything could happen and it was in her best interest to get life insurance policies on her family members. A month after the death of her family members in March of 1987, Frances decided to take out life insurance policies on her 23-year-old husband, Adrian, herself, and her daughter, and there was already a policy on her son. The life insurance policies were $50,000 on each person. In order to complete the deal, Frances, who had already gotten into trouble for forgery, had no issues forging her husband's signature. Her mother was also listed as the secondary beneficiary. According to Frances, Adrian told her he quit using drugs and she believed him because normally he would hide his drugs in the medicine cabinet and when she went to check the cabinet, there were no drugs there. She also mentioned that Adrian would be so scared some nights and sleep under the bed. She feared that Adrian was afraid of a drug dealer who was threatening his life but the events leading up to Adrian's death said otherwise. After taking life insurance policies out on her husband and children, it was the evening of April 7th at the apartment complex located at 6126 West Mount Houston Road in Houston, Texas. Sterling was at the apartment with Adrian and Francis, and at around 6.45 p.m., Adrian spoke to his girlfriend Ramona Bell on the phone for approximately 15 minutes. Francis was there when Adrian was speaking with Ramona, and Ramona said at a later date that Adrian told her he was going to sleep after Francis left that evening. Finally, at around 7.15 p.m., Adrian received another call from a friend by the name of Alphonse Harrison, but this time, Francis answered the phone and asked him to hold. Alphonse was on hold for 45 minutes and decided to finally hang up the phone. Even though Alphonse testified about the time he called their house, Frances said she left the apartment at 6 p.m. in order for Adrian and Sterling to talk to each other and she needed to leave to pay her car insurance. She admitted to answering Alphonse's call, but asserted that he was wrong about the time in which he called. Frances's cousin Sandra said that Frances drove to his house at 6524 Sealy Street in Houston, Texas, which was about 13 minutes away from her apartment. Frances then asked Sandra to come back to her apartment and Sandra said that he noticed Frances take a blue bag out of her car and then walked it over to the burned down abandoned house next door that her cousins perished in. Between 7.45 and 8 p.m., Frances and Sandra made it to Frances' apartment and the phone rang immediately. Frances answered it and Sandra could hear her say, I think he's asleep. I'll see if I can wake him. That's when Frances said that she discovered that Andrew, Alton, and Farah had been killed. The person who called was on hold, but Sandra ended up ending the call in order to call 911. The caller was Alphonse, so Sandra was able to testify a more accurate time he called, which was after the murders. At 8.27 p.m., R.W. Ricks from the Harris County Sheriff's Department was dispatched to 6126 West Mount Houston Road. Rick was the first officer to arrive at the scene of the crime, and he discovered the dead bodies of Adrian, Alton, and Farah. Adrian was lying on the couch while Alton and Farah were in their beds. A day after the murders, an anonymous female called the Harris County Sheriff's Department and let them know that there was a red pickup truck at the scene of the crime and gave them a license plate number. She said the person getting into the truck was a black male around 30 years old. Police had this tip but did not follow through with obtaining any more information and did not question the individual driving the pickup truck. As time passed, Sandra went to police and let them know that Frances put a blue bag in an abandoned house that belonged to her parents. Police ended up going to that abandoned house and found the blue bag which contained a 25 caliber semi-automatic pistol. Police then took the gun in for tracing and found out it belonged to a Michael Mooton. After speaking with investigators, Michael informed them that he loaned his gun to his cousin, Jeffrey Freelo. Investigators then spoke with Jeffrey and he said that he usually kept the gun in his drawer in his bedroom, 
but his girlfriend did his laundry and had easy access to it. Upon further talking, investigators found out that his girlfriend was none other than Francis Newton. On April 21st, Francis filed claims on the life insurance policies and she was arrested the very next day and charged with capital murder. During trial, investigators said that although there was no blood found on Francis, there was gunpowder residue on the hem of her skirt. Defense argued that the nitrates found on the skirt was fertilizer. They expressed that nitrates could be found in cosmetics, tobacco smoke, fertilizer, and urine. Francis's uncle let investigators know that they had a large garden with a lot of fertilizer, and he thinks Francis came in contact with the fertilizer. During trial, everything about the nitrates was only what the jury heard because the state failed to conduct tests to prove where the nitrates truly came from. Defense also argued that there was no residue on her hands or shirt, and if the victims were shot at close range, that would have definitely been found on her. They also made mention that the pistol found in the abandoned house was the murder weapon. Francis supposedly had another gun and kept mentioning that it was not the murder weapon. There are so many things that I don't know and I don't have answers to, but there are some things that I do know and that I know that if a jury knew that they would have come to a different decision. The, the issue with the ballistics and the gun, um, they would have found out that the shell casings found there didn't match the weapon that they're saying is the murder weapon. That still hasn't been brought up in any of the court hearings, you know. And that's a major, that's something I didn't know, but that um, one of the attorneys working on the case now told me about. That the, and those are like fingerprints. Um, it's, it's something that wasn't brought up in trial, you know, and I think that the jury should, be able, should have been able to hear that. What I know is that Sergeant Freeze told my father when he came to get me from my, from my parents' house that there were two guns in the state's possession and the gun that I had wasn't the murder weapon. He told my father I would be back for that reason. Uh, Ron Mock, when, we first, when I was first arrested and began going to court, he told us that there were two guns in the state, state's evidence and the gun that I had wasn't the murder weapon. As far as the ballistics test coming back, saying that uh, the gun in the state's evidence is a murder weapon, I don't know. You know, it, it may be, but what I know is that the gun I had the night that I left, the day that I left my apartment, is not the murder weapon. During trial, Sterling, Adrian's girlfriend Ramona, Alfonso, Sandra, and Jeffrey all testified. There was an ear witness who also told investigators that he heard a gunshot at around 7.30 p.m., but he did not testify in front of the jury. Frances, on the other hand, asserted that she did not kill her family and it was a drug dealer who committed the murders. She said that Adrian owed his dealer, Charlie, $1,500. Adrian's brother, Sterling, spoke with investigators and he claimed that it was true that his brother was in debt and let them know where the drug dealer lived. Although investigators had this information before trial, they never followed the leads and did not follow through with the drug debt being the cause of the murders. Frances was questioned about forging her signature on the life insurance policies, and she said that the only reason why she did it was to prevent Adrian from learning that she had set money aside for the payments because she was afraid he would use the money for drugs. Evidence during trial suggested that Frances was at her home at 7 o'clock p.m. and left no later than 7.20 before coming back. Frances said that on that evening while Adrian was watching television, she opened the medicine cabinet where Adrian kept his drugs and found a pistol there and took it. She said that earlier that day, Adrian told her that he got into some trouble, so she wanted to take the gun out of the house, so she put it in a duffel bag and brought it to her cousin's house. Frances said that on that evening while Adrian was watching television, she opened the medicine cabinet where Adrian kept his drugs and found a pistol there and took it. She said earlier that day Adrian told her that he got into some trouble and she did not want the gun in her house, so she took it out of the house and put it in a duffel bag and brought it to her cousin's house. Defense argued that police found the murder weapon a day after the murders and the results came back while Frances was at the police station, but she was never arrested. She was arrested two weeks later only because she and her mother tried collecting the life insurance money. Francis's father, B. Henry, signed an affidavit stating that police told him if ballistics failed to implicate her as the killer, she would be released, and she was released after the report. 
they were told that the gun found was not the murder weapon. During trial, police officers testified that the murder weapon presented during trial appeared to be similar to the one recovered and tested, but it was not identified by the serial number. Francis was found guilty on October 25, 1988, for the murders of Adrian, Alton, and Farah, and she was sentenced to death by method of lethal injection. Throughout her years on death row, there were many appeals. Her new representation claimed that on April 8, 1987, days after the murder, is when detectives went into Francis' apartment and asked for her to show them what she was wearing the day of the murders. She pointed them out, and that is when the clothes were taken in as evidence. With information like this, her appeals were still denied. Francis spent almost 18 years on death row and had received a 120-day stay of execution that was granted by Governor Perry because Francis's legal team claimed that evidence in her case was lacking and prior representation was not good. During the stay of execution, Francis's new legal aides claimed that there was a third gun found and the gun Francis had was not the murder weapon. They also said that trial transcripts from Francis's old lawyer, Ron Mock, admitted that he had not spoken to one witness. Uh, Mock has already said he was tired, he didn't want to take the case. So he didn't even look, I don't even think he looked at the police report, you know. One of my neighbors said they heard gunshots at 7.30. Why weren't they brought to testify in trial, you know? I just saw that in the clemency report, you know? I never knew that. That person should have been brought to trial to testify. That was something the defense was supposed to do and never did. They also said that Sandra testified and was quoted saying that Frances immediately screamed and bolted to the bedroom. She began to frantically scream uncontrollably. I could not calm her down enough to elicit the apartment's address. I know in my heart that after watching the reaction of Frances upon discovering her family's dead bodies, there is absolutely no way she had any involvement in their deaths. Frances's appeals were still denied, and her new execution date was scheduled for September 14, 2005. On execution day, Frances refused to request a last meal, and when it was time for the actual execution, she remained silent and offered no last words. Thank you all for watching another episode of Death Row Executions. And if you haven't already, please check out my last video on last meals and last words of inmates in Texas that were executed in the year of 2001.